Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Kara Cargo Froom. She is a postdoc fellow in animal nutrition at the University of Guelph. So, Kara, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do? Yes. So, I, um, as you introduced, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Guelph, and I'm currently working with Dr. Jennifer Ellis and in conjunction with Mad Barn, which is an equine nutrition company. Uh, so my background is in animal nutrition and animal biology. My degrees all come from the University of Guelph, but my focus in my master's was companion animal mineral nutrition, whereas in my PhD, I flipped over to protein quality comparison methodology or comparison of the methodologies. And now I'm actually transitioning into a modeling lab where I'm going to be working on more in vitro work, which was one of the approaches I used in my PhD study. And we're currently looking at characterizing a whole bunch of equine feedstuff. And those characterizations of in vitro digestion are eventually going to feed in as inputs for an equine digestion and equine metabolism computer model. Gotcha. So yeah, speaking of the um, in vitro, like you mentioned, I saw that study about you using three different analysis methods to determine um, digestibility co coefficients for certain pulse grains. Could you explain what that was and what your team did for that study? Yes. So the major approach for this was to compare different methodologies that are currently utilized to either assess digestibility of a nutrient or bioavailability of a nutrient. So I think to start, we need to tease apart what these specific methodologies are. And the three methodologies we looked at comparing specifically were ileal digestibility. So that's where we actually cannulate an animal and that cannula or a tube is inserted at the terminal ileum. So the end of the small intestine. So we can sample digesta or the passage of food prior to it entering the colon and the cecum, so the hind gut of the animal, where fermentation occurs. And this is because ileal digestibility is a more accurate measurement, specifically when we're talking about amino acid digestibility, than if we're looking at total tract digestibility, because there are inherent um, errors or variability that's added in that actually reduces the accuracy of our measurements for digestibility. Then we have our indicator amino acid oxidation methodology. And this methodology is actually looking at bioavailability of an amino acid. So what this means is unlike digestibility where we're looking at that disappearance from the gastrointestinal tract, so what was absorbed from that food passing through the intestine, in bioavailability, we're actually looking at almost that end picture. So we're taking into account not only the disappearance from the gut or the gastrointestinal tract, but we're actually also looking at how that nutrient and what form it is and how it's utilized in the body. So if that's protein synthesis or oxidation of that amino acid for energy. And bioavailability is going to be different than digestibility because there are compounds that can be absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, such as cross-linked amino acids but those can't actually be incorporated into protein or utilized in the same manner that free amino acids are. And then we have our in vitro digestion. And what in vitro digestion is looking at specifically, we use the TIM1, which is a dynamic in vitro system, is we're looking at the bioaccessibility of the nutrient. So in a dynamic system, we can still measure absorption to a degree, we can't measure bioavailability because, again, some of those small cross-linked amino acids may be absorbed. And because it's an in vitro system, which means it's outside of an animal replicated in a lab system to replicate that in vivo or in animal system, we're only measuring passive diffusion. And if we think back to digestion, so our ileal digestion, we also have active transport of nutrients. So we're not actually getting the full picture in an in vitro system. So one of the reasons we wanted to compare these is because they all measure different things, but also we can get similar results from them. But there have been no direct comparisons of the same ingredients within the same population of animals for our in vivo studies and replicated in an in vitro system with the same exact diets. So by doing this and by 
uh, comparing these, we can kind of assess what our best approach is currently in the industry to continue measuring digestibility, bioavailability, because we don't want to overfeed an animal, but we don't want to underfeed an animal as well. So by comparing these methodologies, we can narrow down what our best approach is, but also as we move towards a more focus on animal welfare, these in vitro systems that we're comparing may replace in vivo systems. So we can increase animal welfare by reducing the overall use of animals and potentially even using in vitro as pilot before moving into animal studies or completely replacing them. Gotcha. Okay. And then, so I also saw that you looked, um, cause there was a lot to pull out of this study from when I was reading it, but I also saw that you looked at the three protein sources with the, um, fava beans, lentils, and pea, um, did you see any, um, bet- like when, I guess, comparing the three, any strong differences or weaknesses or pros to using one method over the other, or were they all fairly similar in the um, analysis? So first I'd like to just pull out in terms of our standardized allele digestibility Uh, there was no difference between the ingredients for digestibility. So in terms of utilization, we can most likely incorporate all three. Now, it's just considering what's the most cost effective. Um, I also think, you know, pulses are a huge uh, export crop in Canada, but we do grow a lot of pulses. So what can we source locally? But if we look at the comparison of methodologies, for example, this is where we're running into some tricky things. So for example, the TIM is less well-established than static in vitro methods. So <clears throat> we were able to get digestibility values, and but they were quite different compared to our in vivo digestibility values, which we didn't expect based on the limited TIM studies that are currently out there. For the indicator, unfortunately, my study wasn't as successful as another study that was run in our lab that was similar. Um, We had many pigs that didn't reach steady state. And what that means is when we're using an indicator amino acid uh, for oxidation studies, we want it to reach a plateau. And that didn't actually happen in a lot of pigs, which means we had to omit that data. So our data set wasn't as robust. We didn't have a lot of pigs acting as their own control. So while we did um, find a trend in Amarillo P for a decrease in that linear oxidation, which means we can measure bioavailability, we didn't see that in the fava bean. And so this doesn't suggest that the amino acid won't, um, for example, that these uh, ingredients aren't useful for the animal or that they can't uh, supply sufficient amino acids. But what this does suggest is there may have been something other within the ingredients and we needed a longer adaptation period, whether the animals just due to their growth or they were methionine deficient so that the phenylalanine pool didn't balance out. So there was a whole bunch of factors that played into there. So we don't really have as much uh, bioavailability data to compare to the ileal. But really what this shows is that we need further investigation into the comparison of methodologies. So yeah, like like you said, I think there are some instances where um, certain, like the cannulation might not always be the best scenario, even though usually times for the swine industry it is, but there are certain times when the in vitro or the um, oxidation method might be um, helpful to kind of gain some more or novel data on that. So I appreciate the work you did and I appreciate you as well coming on and sharing those studies with us. Excellent, thank you. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to talk about it. It's uh, quite a large study. So slipping in overall results along with the description, it's a lot to go over, but I'm happy to chat. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.